Great. Thank you very much, Jane. Good to see everybody. Um, I'm slightly terrified of having live illustration. I'm not quite sure why I agreed to this. Um, but I think the last time I had a live illustrator, there was a picture of me at the end with a massive syringe in my hand, ready to inject people. Um, anyway, so great to uh, have a chance to talk to you today. Sorry that we can't be there live in person, but hopefully you'll uh, find some of the talk interesting. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, okay. So Jane, if you can just confirm, you can see my first slide. Yeah, hopefully someone can tell me. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. So I'm gonna tell you all today about skinny jeans. Okay, so before we start, I just could like to do a little poll. So Jane, if you're ready, we're gonna ask everybody uh, what they think about this question. So do skinny people exercise a lot, eat very little or have very good genes? Time to vote folks. Wow, interesting, okay. It's shifting a little bit and we're almost there. A few more people left to vote. I think it looks like a pretty clear conclusion, even with the last two votes still to come in but it looks like at least 80% of people think that thin people are skinny people are skinny because they have good genes. Oh, 100% voted, excellent. 80% people think people are skinny because they have good genes, very interesting. So that doesn't add up to 100%, but we've got some people <laughs> voting for more than one answer. Uh, but let's tell you about the biology of thinness, uh, how much is down to genes, how much is down to exercise, how much is down to eating but great to see what you all think uh, and let's see what the science tells us. So my name is Sadaf Faruhi. I'm a professor of metabolism and medicine uh, at the Institute of Metabolic Science in Cambridge. And I'm gonna share with you some of the work that we've been doing to try to understand about skinny genes. So why are some people thin? I've just asked you that question and we'll all have our own take on this, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about the science and let's see what the science tells us. Well, of course, it's quite easy to think that, you know, being thin is probably about down to choices. Is it the food you choose to eat? Some people make healthy choices, some people make not so healthy choices. And does that effectively dictate our weight uh, and how much weight people gain and whether some people can stay thin? Then you could say, well, actually, you know, the thin people are somewhat morally superior. You know, they make the right choices, but also they don't eat too much. Uh, whereas people who struggle with their weight eat a lot more. Um, and, you know, this is a kind of cartoon and the typical way often people might depict someone um, who's struggling with their weight, who has a generous appetite. Or is it you could say, well, look, you know, a lot of people are thin because they just they're not lazy. They don't sit on the sofa the whole time. In fact, quite the opposite. They're doing a lot of activity um, and they're burning calories. And that's why they stay thin. Or could it be actually that there's a lot of genetic evidence for, for people staying thin because they have certain genes that are keeping them thin. And I'm gonna share with you some of the evidence about all of these areas. Uh, and at the end of it, we'll see what we think uh, about the contribution of genes to people being thin and how the genes might affect um, our weight. So why am I interested in this topic? Well, I'm interested because I see a lot of people with problems at the other side of the spectrum, that is people who struggle with their weight. Uh, and the challenge is that while a lot of people watch their weight very closely, um, there are some people who struggle with their weight and actually we don't really have a great deal of advice on how to guide them other than telling people to go on a strict diet uh, and hoping for the best. So what we're trying to understand as part of our research is why do some people gain weight more easily than others? How come some people are able to stay thin and if we can understand those two questions, can we find better ways to prevent and treat obesity? Now, when we're thinking about thinness and people being thin, actually, there've always been people who are healthy and thin. And I'm specifically talking about people who are healthy and thin and not really people about uh, talking about eating disorders. That's quite a different uh, condition. So here's a kind of, um, old rhyme or old story that some of you will know about, uh, which is that Jack Spratt was always very thin and they talked about his wife who really liked her food, as you can see. So there've always been people who can stay slim um, no matter what environment. By the same token, there've always been some people who gain a lot of weight. 
And while we tend to think about obesity as a modern condition, actually there are many textbooks, many photographs, paintings even of people who have struggled with their weight. Um, there are even textbooks from uh, ancient Greece talking about obesity, weight problems, and some of the conditions that go with weight problems, such as breathing problems and even fertility problems. So being too heavy or even too thin has been known about for a long time. Of course, um, many, many years ago, people were too thin because they didn't have enough access to food and it was um, a sign of poor nutrition. But actually in every environment, there's been a spectrum of weight in the population. So here's a photograph of identical twins at the top and non-identical twins underneath. And you can see that the identical twins are very similar in their height, in their weight, but also in where they put their extra weight. Um, of course, if you look across the sets of twins, people are very different. And of course, we know that. Now here you look at non-identical twins who are just like siblings, um, and you can see there's a lot of variation in their weight, in their height, and also where they might put some extra weight. And these kinds of studies of twins really talk, tell us about what's called heritability. That means how much of a person's weight is down to their genes. Now, this simple cartoon really illustrates how we think about weight. So it's really the balance between your genes and your environment. Now, you could say, well, look, you know, you can control your environment. You can control what you eat and how much exercise you do. Uh, and I'll show you some of the, the detail around that. But essentially, it's the genes that you have and the environment that you're in will influence your weight, how much you eat, how many calories you burn, and ultimately where you lie on the spectrum of weight in the population. Now, of course, we know that people are getting generally heavier, but even in our environment where there's a lot of junk food around and generally we're not so active, there are some people who can stay thin. Now, I just wanted to say a little bit about the environment because when we talk about uh, eating a bit too much, not exercising very much, it's quite easy to think that people who are really struggling with their weight must be eating loads and people who are staying quite thin are clearly not eating as much and are clearly um, exercising more. And it's kind of almost easy to blame heavy people for their obesity or their weight problem and almost congratulate thin people for staying thin. But actually, if we look at the, the data, this is what we see. So this is the changes in the pattern of obesity in the UK. So the blue is what it used to be about 30 years ago, uh, and the red pattern is what it is more recently, like now. Um, and this is the distribution for what's called BMI or body mass index, okay? Uh, and what we see is that what's changed from the blue to the red is the average weight or BMI has shifted to the right. So your average person now is heavier than they were say 30 years ago. It's certainly true if you look at children in school, but also in adults, people are generally a bit heavier, okay? But also what we see is that the shape of this curve has changed. So there are, there've always been some people who are very heavy and always some people who are very thin. Now what happens is there are still some people who are pretty thin, but there are now more people who are heavy, okay? So the shape of the curve has also changed. Now you could say, well, how much has it taken to do that, okay? Well, what you'll be surprised with is that if you eat seven calories a day more than you burn, and you do that consistently over 30 years, that's enough to change a person's weight by about 10 kilos, that's enough to change the BMI on this graph by three units. And that's enough to explain the change in the UK population over this time. So it actually only takes a small amount of extra calories more than you burn to actually cause the change in the population that we're seeing. Now, seven calories a day is really not very much, okay? It's pretty much the same as a, a slice of cucumber, okay? Now that's a, quite frightening really for those of us um, who enjoy our food because it's very easy to eat perhaps one slice of cucumber more than you need. Um, and what this tells us really is that the body is generally pretty good at maintaining a stable weight. But if we eat a bit more than we burn, then over time we will gain weight. What's surprising though, is that how come some people can 
not do that and they stay thin. So this suggests that there must be a system for controlling our weight because otherwise we would go up and down all the time. Okay. Now the system is clearly not perfect because otherwise we would all have a perfect weight. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that system and how it works. So actually we all have a system for controlling our weight. Even animals have a system. And that's because having enough energy to survive is pretty fundamental. Um, we all need calories, we need energy to survive, we need energy to reproduce. We need to be able to conserve energy when there's not enough food around, which is during hibernation or during the winter. So animals and people have developed a system to regulate our weight, which allows us to um, store extra energy, particularly if we're starving, to go out and look and hunt for food to store calories and be ready for periods like hibernation when there's not much food around and to be able to change our behavior uh, depending on the environment. Now, how do we know that there is such a system? Well, people have done studies. So here's some studies uh, in animals where what you do is you, you may take a, a normal weight animal and you don't give it enough food, you limit its food um, and then you release that break. Okay, you give it back the food. And what you find is that the animal that's not had enough food will quickly start eating more and restore its weight to back to normal. Okay. And if you do it again, the same happens. And in fact, in animals, even if you have an animal that might be a bit heavy, again, if you limit its access to food, uh, its weight will go down. If you release that and you give it more food, the animal will quickly eat more to restore its weight to normal. Okay. So animals have a really fine tuned system that keeps their weight normal and tells them to go out and hunt or look for food when they have not got enough energy reserves. Now, what's fascinating is that only really in the last 20 years have we realized that people have a system like that. Um, we didn't really know that, but now we know much more about the system. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about this system because it's changes in this system that influence why some people gain weight easily and some people stay thin. Now, the system for controlling our weight is really centered on a really key area of the brain called the hypothalamus. It's a bit like the control center of the brain. Okay. Now, where is the hypothalamus? Well, pretty much it's right behind the nose. So if you kind of go slightly deep into the brain around that point, you'll find this really small part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And it's really critical because it controls many, many different things. Okay. So for example, it controls our sleep. Okay. Uh, now in some people, if they might have a problem in this part of the brain, like a tumor or a cyst, then actually they may find that they're sleeping constantly um, because this sleep system is not working properly. Now there are also centers in this part of the brain to control your temperature. So sometimes people may have a really high fever, for example, that's all picked up and detected in this part of the brain. Now, what we know is that this part of the brain also controls hunger and fullness. So again, if people might have a tumor or a cyst in this part of the brain, they will often feel incredibly hungry, want to eat all the time um, and not feel full. And that's because this system is not working. Well, what we've been interested in is can we find the genes that affect this system so that we can figure out why the system might not work in some people who are heavy and also why it might work really well in people who are thin. Now, how do you go about trying to figure out genes for anything? And the same is true if you're looking at genes for eye color, hair color, and actually the same would be true if you're looking for genes for schizophrenia, or if you are looking for genes for blood pressure problems. Um, you have to try really to find almost like a needle in a haystack. You've got to find the genes that are really um, adding up to contribute to a particular trait or a particular aspect of the body. So, um, you, you know, it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what we did was say, well, look, let's try and find a big needle, right? Let's find something that has a major effect on someone's weight. And what we decided to do was to study children who were very heavy from a young age. Okay. Uh, and we set up the genetics of obesity study or goose you can find out more at this website where we were asking doctors to let us know about children who they were looking after who were very heavy 
and we wanted to try and find the genes that might be not working in these children so that we could try to figure out the system. And the way that we thought about this is that these children might give us the vital clue. If we could find the way into what is otherwise a really complicated problem, could we prove that a single gene is not working and that causes these children to get really heavy? And if we could prove that, it allows us to understand the system that's there to control our weight. And maybe if we could understand that system, we could find new targets for therapy and help these children and others. Now, a key way of finding that out came from studies in animals, which really led to the discovery of this system here. And this system is there in animals and in people. And this is a little bit about how it works. So here's some of the science behind this. So our brain is really the, the key to all of this. And I told you about the hypothalamus, which lies just behind the nose, deep in the brain. And what happens is the hypothalamus receives all the signals from the body and puts it all together. So for example, your fat, right? Um, I'm sitting here tapping my tummy here, uh, but our fat is there not just to store extra calories or as a bit of insulation, but actually it makes hormones. And those hormones go in the blood and then they actually act in the brain. And they tell the brain how much fat you have. So for example, if you're very thin, you're starving, for example, your, uh, your brain will pick up a signal that you don't have much fat. And of course, if you have plenty of fat, your brain will also get that signal. Now, one of the key signals that tells us the, the brain about how much nutrients you have is leptin. Now, what leptin actually does is once it gets in the brain, it triggers a bit of a chain reaction. So you have nerves in the brain, neurons, which are shown here with these kind of blue uh, neurons from here, and they do different jobs. So there are some of them in the brain that are there to tell you to eat, okay? The code for one of those in green here is called AGRP. And the reason that you have that is that if you're starving, if you don't have enough food, if you're fasting, for example, if you're on a diet, AGRP will be released in the brain telling you to eat something, okay? It's really fundamental to make you um, eat to survive. Now, what happens if you have enough calories, you've eaten a meal, actually that's when leptin kicks in, okay? And leptin is telling you, um, stopping you from starving and telling you when you've eaten a meal that you can stop eating now, okay? And what happens is it triggers another chemical in the brain called POMC or PUMC, okay? Uh, and then that one is released. And it's the balance between these chemicals in the brain that effectively determines what you might eat. So if you're starving, you'll get more AGRP and that's the signal to eat. If you've had a meal, you don't need to eat anymore. You'll get more of this signal on the red side that tells you now to stop eating. Now, these signals have to be put together to uh, result in a change in, in what you're gonna do. And a key gene that controls really our appetite and our weight is something called the melanocortin-4 receptor or MC4R for short. And this is really important because when we studied this pathway, we found that people who are lacking these genes or where these genes are faulty, they can't control their appetite. They're often really hungry. They really want to eat food and they gain a lot of weight as a result. Um, so some people have faults in leptin. Some people have faults in the leptin receptor, in POMC, but actually quite a lot of people have faults in the MC4 receptor. It's actually the commonest gene for weight problems. About one in 500 people will have a faulty gene. And having a faulty gene will cause them to be heavy. And we're gonna come back to this gene uh, a bit later. So all of these genes that cause obesity uh, are working in the brain. And the system for regulating our appetite is working in the brain. Now, what we were able to do is to say, okay, well, can we learn a bit more about the brain and how it works, okay? Because if the system was perfect, our weight would be perfect the whole time. So the system is clearly not perfect and the system can clearly change at certain times. So what we and others have been doing is bringing in people who volunteer for our research and trying to understand how this circuit in the brain with these genes, how is it changing with our environment? 
So what we do is we ask people to come in and they lie in a brain scanner, in an MRI scanner, okay? And when they lie in the scanner, we show them certain pictures. So we show them pictures of really appetizing food versus bland food like a broccoli, okay? And what is really quite remarkable is that your brain lights up in different ways depending upon the picture that we show you. So for example, if we show you pictures of donuts or burgers, you get lots of activation in the reward centers of the brain, right? So these are the parts of the brain that are activated by pleasure. They're also activated by things like smoking and alcohol and certain drugs. Now, what we find is that for most people, donuts, burgers, cakes, things like that will cause a lot of activation of the parts of the brain. Whereas things like broccoli, actually for most of us, they look pretty much the same as a table or a chair or something quite neutral. Now, of course, what's really interesting is people are very different. So there are some people who actually their brain lights up with broccoli. I would say they're a bit abnormal. We tend to study them, um, but we're quite fascinated to, to learn about why people are different like this. But for most people, it's the appetizing or rewarding food that causes the brain to light up. Now you could say, well, why does that happen, right? Is that partly biology? And it is in part because these foods have got more calories and your brain knows they have more calories, and so you tend to like them more. But also we learn these things in our environment, right? So we learn that this kind of food is palatable, got a lot of sugar in it, got a lot of fat in it. Um, and also that's partly why we tend to eat these kind of foods when we're stressed. So, you know, getting activation in these parts of the brain makes you feel better. So if you are, partly hardwired and you partly learn that a donut is gonna make you feel better, it's not a surprise that when you're very stressed, you're more likely to reach for the donut than you are for the broccoli. Now, I've got some carrot sticks on this slide and there's a particular reason that I show these carrot sticks. And that's to remind me about a really interesting study that was done where people try to figure out whether it's the food or whether it's the association with the food that's actually changing the pattern in the brain and how you feel. And what they did was they gave children um, carrot sticks in a plain bag versus carrot sticks in a McDonald's bag, okay? Um, and what they found is that the children rated the carrot sticks in the McDonald's bag as much more pleasing and appetizing than the regular carrot sticks. And what that shows you is of course about association. So the children have learned to associate the McDonald's logo and the wrapping and the advertising with something that's more pleasurable, even when it's carrot sticks. Okay. And so this really illustrates some of the complexity about what we eat. There is clearly genes involved because if they're not working, children become very heavy, they want to eat all the time. But also there is the properties of the food itself, which is very rewarding. And there's also our environment and how we learn about the food and the habits that we develop. And all of that combines together to affect our appetite. So this is really important to understand because this shows us it's not as simple as just telling people, don't eat this or do this, because there is a real biology at play. So I'm gonna pause here with the carrot sticks. I'd like to see what our artist Josh is making of all of this. So Josh, can we see what you've come up with so far? Right, so can we... Can we uh, Yes, hello. Hi there. I'm just drawing the carrot stick. Uh, and I think I may draw the carrot and the stick. Um, right. Very good. <laughs> so far. <laughs> but I have to do that once we begin again. But so far, I've got in the on the left hand side, uh, obviously, the pun around skinny jeans. Uh -huh. um, and the, the, the opening question, do skinny people exercise, eat little or have good genes? Why are some people thin? Um, and then uh, I'm showing the seesaw diagram that you have uh, showed in the middle there. Still got to finish that. And there's somebody eating a, a cucumber on the heavy side of the, uh, of the seesaw. And then as we go across, we can see that uh, what you were saying about the hypothalamus right, yeah. um, is, uh, is activated in, uh, and there's arrows pointing to the person on the seesaw and the lion who's grabbing a donut as we speak. I don't right, know if you can see that, great. That, that's what's come out so far. Terrific. And now I'm going to attempt to fill in the gaps. 
and and, um, and draw the carrot and the stick. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, thanks for that, Josh. We'll come back to you at the end. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so I've been really setting the scene for how we think about weight problems um, because it was it's a good chance to tell you now how we're thinking about thinness and how that can help. So as I've been explaining, we know that whatever our environment, there's a lot of variation in weight. So some people, most people are in the middle, some people really struggle with their weight, and some people are pretty thin and can stay thin and healthy quite easily. Okay. Now, our environment has a role to play, but what we want to do is to figure out and measure what is the effect of genes. Now, as I've mentioned so far, our work on genes has focused on people who are pretty heavy. And what we found there is several key genes that regulate our appetite and showed that variants or changes in those genes can cause weight problems uh, in some people. Now, these kind of variants don't affect weight in the whole population, but just in some people who really struggle with their weight. Now, if you look at the more general population, what you find is that using sort of different technologies that there are hundreds of, in fact, thousands of different genes. And if you add up the effect of them all together, you can figure out that there are some people who have a, a larger burden. If you like the score, when you add up all those genes is a bit higher, they tend to be a bit heavier. And there are other people who have a lower score. So this would explain why, for example, you know, you might be a bit heavier than your neighbor or someone in your family has always struggled with their weight, whatever they do, they lose a bit, they gain it again. Those people probably have a higher score for these common genes, add them all together, just makes them much more likely to gain weight than the next person. Now, what's really interesting is that as the technologies got better, we can find more and more of these genes. We don't know what they all are, but we know that they're linked somehow to weight problems. And in the last, literally in the last year or two, we've been able now with newer technologies to add up all of these genes, in fact, 2 million of them and make a score. And that score really reflects how likely people are to gain weight. And that really is important because it speaks to the fact that there's a strong genetic component and we can now quantify it, we can measure it. Now, what we were interested in doing is trying to see what's happening at the really thin end of the spectrum. And to that end, we set up a study working with many general practices, actually about 600, 800 general practices around the country and asked them to help us to find people who were thin. And this study is called STILTS. And we were really looking for people who are thin but don't have an eating disorder, don't have a medical condition that's causing them to be thin. They're not exercising too much, in fact, hardly at all. And really it was thanks to loads of people who volunteered and came forward uh, and often their families said, look, I know somebody who's really thin, they can eat what they like, they never put on weight. And uh, they volunteered for our research. And we now have this cohort called STILTS that we're studying to try to find some genes. Now, this is just a bit of the science that we've been doing around that um, and not really to go into too much detail, but what we found is that score that I mentioned to you we can find that there is a really high score in people who are heavy and that the people who are thin have a really low score. Right? Also, we find that there are some genes that are uh, much more prevalent in heavy people and there are other genes that are much more prevalent in thin people. So there are people who are thin are thin because they have less of the genes that contribute to being overweight and they have some extra genes that are keeping them thin. And what we're doing now is we're really pinpointing some of those specific genes and trying to figure out how they work. Now, one of the genes that we uh, worked on uh, is the MC4 gene that I told you about uh, quite a few slides ago. It's the key control point for weight. Uh, and working with my colleagues in the MRC epidemiology unit in Cambridge, we studied a really powerful resource in the UK called Biobank. Now in Biobank, half a million people in the UK have volunteered, they gave a blood sample and they gave a lot of their information about their health records. And we can look into that resource to try to test different genes. 
And what we did is we picked our favorite gene MC4 and we looked at that in the biobank cohort. And what we did in, in my lab is that we took the different versions of the MC4 gene, the different variants, and we studied them very extensively in cells. So we sort of said, let's take each one of these and work out what it's actually doing to the gene. Is it stopping the gene from working? Is it having no effect? What's it actually doing? Now here's just a bit of a complicated slide, but the key point to really know is that there are lots and lots of different changes in just this one gene in the population. So when you look at half a million people, there are 61 different changes just in this one gene. And when we characterize them in cells, we're trying to figure out what's the gene change actually doing. For some people, the gene is not working so well, okay? We call that a, a loss of function. And for other people, what we were really surprised about is the gene is working too well, okay? It's working over time. Okay? So then we wanted to say, well, okay, does it matter to the person if their gene is working really well, or does it matter if the gene is not working so well? And we basically can simplify that by saying, what happens if you've got a gain of function, if the gene is working more than it should do, it's like a super powerful gene, or what if it's not working? Now, what we did is when we split people up, depending on just what's happening in the one gene, what we found is that the people in whom the gene wasn't working tended to be heavier, okay? That fitted with the work that we'd done before where the children were heavier if this gene was faulty. But the people who had the gene that was super active, that was working really well, they actually were protected from obesity. They tended not to gain weight. And in fact, when we looked at diabetes, we found that the people who had the gene that tended to be faulty, tended to gain weight and tended to be more likely to have diabetes. Whereas people who had the super protective variant in the gene were much more likely to be protected from diabetes as well. So this was really powerful because it's one gene and the changes that you have in that gene can influence whether you're more likely to be heavy or whether you're protected from being heavy. Then we went on a bit further to figure out what is it about this gene that's causing this switch. And what we found is that there's a particular molecule in the cells that the gene interacts with, shown in green over here. And it's literally the strength of that interaction. So if the gene sends you down one pathway, you're more likely to be heavy. If it goes down another pathway, you're more likely to be slim. And this basically is really fascinating because now we could try to see if we can understand how this works to design new treatments. Now, this is just a bit more of the science about how we would do that. When you have a gene like a receptor, which is what this is, it's sitting on the surface of a, of a cell in the brain. Normally you have these receptors and after about 10 minutes, they switch off because you know it's done its job. And what happens is in the thin people, they have a really subtle change in the gene, which keeps it there, okay? It basically, it doesn't switch off. Now, the gene, the MC4 gene, its normal job is to tell you to stop eating. So if it doesn't switch off, you effectively keep getting the signal that's telling you, I don't need to eat. And so you're not going to be that interested in food. You won't eat and you're unlikely to overeat. And so that's why you're staying thin and you're protected from obesity. And so here's one really clear example and one of the first really clear examples of a specific gene which is different in different people. And that difference explains why some people are more likely to be heavy and some people are more likely to be thin. So we really just wanna wrap up and leave plenty of time for questions. So we've shown with our research that genes can influence our weight and that when they're not working, they can cause severe obesity in some people. And they may even be protecting some people from developing obesity and keeping them thin. Now, we're concerned about helping people who struggle with their weight. And the good thing is that now knowing about these genes has led to testing, becoming uh, official practice and guidance for doctors to test people, particularly when they gain a lot of weight from a young age, like those children that I showed you. And this is important because society's attitude to obesity can be very negative. Often people who struggle with their weight and go on a lot of diets 
are made to feel guilty for causing their weight problem. And I show these headlines here because this was a little child that I looked after who had a faulty gene causing her weight problem. But sadly, she died at a very young age. And the headlines were really horrendous about this child. And her family were effectively had to move house because of the stigma associated with this condition. Uh, and I think one of the key aims of our research is to use our science to shed light on weight problems and bring more understanding to the difficulties that many people face. And what we're hoping is that with research, we can understand more about these genes and how they work. Here's one of the young children that I look after who's been doing some fundraising for our research. Uh, and it's very exciting to work with the children and their families to see how we can take this forward. And it's very exciting for us now because we have some treatments that we're now giving to children and adults uh, with weight problems down to faulty genes. Uh, and when we do those trials, we do them in this really uh, exciting facility that we have on the Addenbrooke's campus. Uh, this is the translational research facility. It's a world-class facilities for clinical research. They look quite nice, as you can see. We have lots of really nice kit, which we can use to try to study people uh, and a wonderful team of staff who actually help us to do this research. And the kind of things that we're doing now are studying people who are uh, overweight and trying out new treatments, but we're also bringing in thin people, okay? So because of all those people who volunteered for our research, what we're doing is trying to figure out exactly how come they stay thin. So at the moment, we don't have the answer yet. We think it's probably a combination of genes, how much you eat and how many calories you burn. But just to give you a little tantalizing clue, we brought somebody in just before COVID. Uh, he was a young man who was 27 years old. Uh, he weighed 42 kilos. Uh, and he was really unhappy because he could not gain weight, whatever he does, right? And a little part of me was thinking, well, surely if you just ate properly and I could get you to gain a bit of weight. But we, he was up for doing some research and so we tried that. And so we kept him in this unit for about 10 days, okay? And we asked him to deliberately overeat. We gave him twice as many calories as he needs, okay? And I'll ask you in a minute what you think happens, but I'll tell you at the very end, I'll get you to vote and tell me what you think happens. Um, but that's the kind of study that we're doing now to try to figure out exactly how the body of some people can allow them to stay thin. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish by uh, with the work that I've said. It's all about the genes, it's all about the brain, but our genes and our environment work together. Uh, and ultimately, yes, we have got to eat less, exercise more, but if we can find the thinness genes, that would be really powerful. Okay, thank you very much, folks, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, so Jane, are you there? Are we ready to chair, or am I gonna look at the question box? Shall I have a look at the question box? Okay, so, okay. I'm gonna kick off with some of the questions in the question and answer session. So first question we've got, oops, it just moved. Uh, Chris has got a question. Why do I get heavier as I get older? Is it because I'm less active or do I now have faulty genes? So that's a really good question. So of course, what you described, Chris, is something that happens to, to many people, right? Um, so of course, your genes don't change as you get older. You're, you're born with those genes and they stay with you. A couple of things change as we get older. So first thing is, our metabolic rate goes down. So the amount of calories that we need actually gets less. So you may eat the same as you did maybe five or 10 years ago, but you won't need as many calories. And that means that you're generally gonna be eating a bit more than you need or you use up. So people will generally get a bit heavier because they're burning less calories. Now, there may also be some other subtleties because we know that actually everybody gets a bit heavier and there are certain time windows when people get heavier. And at the moment, we don't really understand quite how that happens, whether some of our genes switch on or switch off or are fine tuned a bit differently at different stages is something that we and others are trying to work out. Okay, so a question from Julianne, have you done any research around peri and most postmenopausal weight gain and genes? Um, so we haven't. Um, and again, it's a little bit speaks to the same point as, as Chris, is that there are probably certain windows uh, when people gain weight. So 
puberty, for example, pregnancy is another one, menopause is another one, of course, middle age is another one. So there are key times where probably we have developed systems and it's a good idea to put on a bit of extra weight. We know that um, around the menopause, changes in estrogen clearly affect our fat. So estrogen as a hormone does affect where your fat goes and how your fat behaves. So that's probably one of the key things at that point. So a question um, from Jay, are some races more likely to be one end of the other of the BMI spectrum? So there's a lot of interest in this question. So, you know, some people from certain ethnic groups are much more likely to gain weight. Uh, people have done a lot of work, for example, in people from the Pacific Islands, Samoans, Tongans, um, who tend to be much more likely to gain weight. People in the Middle East, for example, have gained weight in a short period of time. There are other people who tend to remain slim, for example, people of Japanese origin. So people are looking at that now and trying to understand those genes. Um, at the moment, there isn't really a clear signature for genes that are keeping different populations um, at different ends of the spectrum, but there's a lot of interest in that. Okay, how does this work interact with the gut microbiome? Uh, studies maybe in mice have found that uh, implants, yeah, okay. So there's a lot of interest in the microbiome. So that's the bugs in the gut um, and whether those bugs uh, may influence how much weight you gain and whether you lose weight with a certain diet. So I guess I would summarize it by saying it's a hot area of interest. A lot of people are doing research. There's quite a bit of work in mice, but whether that's relevant to people, I think the jury is still out on that. Um, it is clear that the diet that you take does influence the bugs in the gut. So you can change the bugs in the gut quite swiftly by changing your diet. The same is true, of course, if you take antibiotics. Um, and whether the change in the bugs in the gut influences your health and your risk of disease is the bit that we don't yet understand. Okay, so uh, with genetic engineering a prospect, do you think genes for being heavy or skinny could be a modification? So, uh, and the question says medical or aesthetic modification. Well, of course, um, medical would be potentially the case. So. You know, you can't change your genes, but gene therapy is something that has been thought about for a, a long time. And now the technology is getting better. So actually, there is the prospect that for people with a very specific faulty gene, that potentially you could correct that with gene therapy. And that is something that uh, groups around the world are working on. And there actually are groups also working on whether that could be useful for other conditions. Okay, so a question from uh, Nyla, I think, can eating disorders be influenced by these genes um, so that, or even damage them? So that's a really good question. So people have looked at eating disorders um, and specifically at anorexia nervosa. And for example, there, there isn't really any, anorexia nervosa is heritable. So it runs in families, which suggests that genes do play a role. At the moment, none have been convincingly found. And there are some clues about genes for anorexia. They don't seem to overlap with the genes for thinness. So suggest that they're probably quite different. So there's still an awful lot more work to be done in that area. Okay, so can genes change over time? We see people who had normal weight 20 years ago, they're getting fatter because of changing their lifestyle. So that's exactly right. And that's a little bit the picture at the very beginning with the, with the seesaw. So our gene, genes haven't changed over time, but it's our environment that's changed but our environment interacts with our genes. So a really good way of describing this was a study that was done in Canada many years ago, where they took identical twins and they basically persuaded people to live in a research unit for a year. And those identical twins, they lived in the unit and they were all deliberately given 10% more calories than they need. Uh, everybody gained weight, but the amount of weight they gained was really different for everybody, but was very similar for two people in a twin pair. And what that shows us is that, yes, of course, our environment, what we eat and what we exercise um, is important, but how you respond to that will be influenced by your genes. So that's really the way to think about it. Okay. Um, let's see, would you remind Sadaf to look at the illustration? Okay, so should we just pause a little bit and look at the illustration? Josh, are you there? 
Yes, hello, I'm here. Okay, tell us what you've been drawing since. Well, I'm still beavering away. I actually forgot all about the carrot sticks, uh, which isn't the first time, I must admit, that that's happened. Um, and I, I was getting rather involved in trying to draw um, the MPC4R. Oh, gene right. And the molecule that's, uh, that, okay. that magic molecule that's, that's making all the difference. So yes. um, uh, if you can see on the far right-hand side of the drawing, I've um, tried to emulate the diagram you showed me, uh, showed all of us, uh, of the leptin um, being introduced to the hypothalamus. Yes. And um, we can see in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, there's somebody dreaming of donuts and broccoli, um, but the gene... The MPC4R gene is yes. telling, telling us that the MPC4R tells me when to stop. Yep. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you're bringing together all of these concepts, everything from zebras to MC4R <laughs> to broccoli and donuts. Uh, that's fantastic because yes, it's, it's a pretty it's, complicated system. And, um, but it makes sense that for something like eating, which is really fundamental to survival, you need a complicated system to make sure that we can eat and we can survive. Yeah, no, it is, uh, there's quite a lot to take in there. It's quite a soup of ideas. And quite <laughs> honestly, it's, it, it's making me hungry. <laughs> it is. Well, see, that's absolutely true. Um, and that's often the response to my talks. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? So we're talking about food, okay? And uh, we associate that with hunger. Okay? And so what happens is when you're very, very hungry, so for example, if someone goes on a diet or if somebody is fasting, uh, they will pretty much have food on the brain. They'll be thinking about food the whole time. Um, and pretty much I've triggered that by giving this talk. Um, so let's look at some of the other questions. So is there any theoretical basis for BMI? Why weight divided by height squared? So, yeah, I mean, obviously, ideally, we'd like to be able to measure how much fat people have. But doing that involves a, a scan. And that's not something you can do in loads and loads of people. You can do it in research. And so BMI has been derived as a kind of reasonable proxy. So it, it's weight over height squared. And the reason why it's got height in it is that if you just did weight, you can't really adjust for the really big rugby player or for someone whose build is a bit different. Whereas height will allow you a bit of an adjustment for that. It's still not as good as measuring fat, but it's reasonable and it correlates with health outcomes. So generally speaking in a population, the BMI will predict people's chances of getting diabetes or heart problems. Okay, uh, can vegan diet change genetic obesity? Uh, probably not, um, you know, your, your genes are, are your genes. What we do find is that, you know, in the very strong genes and ones at the beginning, I told you about those children, uh, pretty much whatever they, they eat, it, they will gain weight. And people have brought the children into hospital and tried to control things and and see, obviously the more calories you eat, the more weight you will gain, but it's, it's such a strong influence that it's pretty much irrespective of, of the diet. Uh, how does your research inform weight loss in the general population for people not under your care? So that's a really important question. I think what our research shows is, is a few different things. And the same is true of the research of many colleagues is I hope the most, most important thing to come from our research is a more sympathetic understanding to people who struggle with their weight, to realize that a lot of people struggle with their weight and they are contending with the fact that our biology, our genes are set up to try to stop us starving. And they're now trying to cope with an environment where there's a lot of food around and we don't need to do so much. So I hope one of the things we could do is be a little bit more sympathetic and understanding to people who struggle that I think there are two ends of the spectrum. So if we can find ways to reduce what we eat and our choices and our activity, it can help people in general. But at the same time, we need to find ways to look after people and treat people who really struggle with their weight. Uh, and that's a medical kind of condition. Okay, so uh, I think that's most of the questions I can see on my screen. Are they moving, any others moving up or down? Anything we can do to wake up lazy genes? Wow, so that's a good question. Um, I think that's something that we need to figure out. So we can't, you know, in theory, in people where the gene is really not working, something like gene therapy could fix that if someone was really struggling. Um, I think that's a, waking up lazy genes is a really interesting way of phrasing it. So 
there may be times and middle age menopause and others may be those times where the gene is relatively turned down and whether certain things can relatively turn it up. Now, people have done work in animals where they change the diet, for example, and see if that can change the switching on or switching off of genes. So that work has is, is not yet been done. And I think that's a really nice way of phrasing it. Right, so somebody asking about the MC4 gene, still fascinated about uh, the gene maybe in the family, um, how come it only affects two of the household? Yeah, so that's another really interesting phenomenon that we call, generally we refer to penetrance, okay? And what that means is, so for example, if you imagine there are genes for blue eyes, okay? Uh, and there can be some people in the family who have identical blue eyes, and then there'll be other people in the family who have green eyes or slightly hazel colored eyes. So you can have the same gene, but it might show through to a stronger or lesser extent. And that we presume is down to the other genes that you have affecting uh, the total picture, but we really don't understand that much at all. Okay, are there any genetic factors that influence metabolic rate? Uh, so yes, there are. Most of the genes that we and others have discovered so far affect appetite. And that's really interesting because when I first started doing this work about 20 years ago, people didn't really, we didn't know of any genes. This was the, the first one was leptin, but also people, when we'd found genes, people assumed they would be affecting metabolism and how you burn calories, but actually they all affect appetite. There are some genes that affect metabolism. There are specific ones that cause a slow metabolism and a slowness in burning fat. Um, so I think it's quite likely that there will be others. Okay. So somebody asking specifically about um, maintaining a healthy weight over time after losing a lot of weight. Um, so somebody saying they've lost quite a lot of weight and how about maintaining weight? So maintaining weight is a really important question and a really important medical issue because uh, we didn't talk about this phenomenon of yo-yo dieting, right? So when people lose weight, quite often they will regain the weight and often it will overshoot. Now, uh, many doctors tend to sort of uh, wag the finger and blame people for saying, look, you weren't really sticking to the diet very well. Look what you've done. You've gone and regained that weight. And actually, that's not someone's fault. That's biology. Because when you lose weight, what happens is leptin, the hormone I told you about, the real beginning, which comes from your fat, that comes down. And when leptin comes down, the hypothalamus, the brain, picks up the signal, you don't have enough energy. So it tells you to eat. And so the automatic response to losing weight is a drive from the body to tell you to eat more and regain that weight. And actually animals goes back to normal, but people it overshoots. So regaining weight is the body's normal response to a diet. There's not an easy answer to how to keep the weight off. The only main strategy really that's been shown to be helpful is exercise. So exercise can be effective in keeping weight off once you've lost some. People are also looking at whether certain treatments could be helpful to keep weight off in people who've lost weight, but it can be really hard and it's one of the hardest things. So, um, gosh, many questions coming here. Can your GP order a test to see if you have faulty genes? So the test for genes um, is now available in the NHS. Usually it has to come from a consultant um, and usually it's for people who've gained a lot of weight since, a, since they've been a young age. Um, but the tests are now available and approved in the NHS. Uh, I hope in time there'll be a wider availability of testing for genes um, so that people can have more information about weight problems. Are there any studies being done that people, overweight people could participate in? Uh, so yes, they, yes, there are. So if you look at the um, Institute website, but also my website that I put in the beginning, uh, we have a, an email address for uh, people to volunteer. If you aren't sure about the addresses, if you put in my name, you could probably find our website quite easily. Uh, if you're thin and your MC4 tells you not to eat anymore, but you continue, but keep your over overall weight as thin. So yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I suspect if you've got one of those changes in the MC4 gene that is protective and keeping you thin, uh, you might eat a bit more on certain days, but it'll even out over time. 
and you will probably then end up not really gaining the weight because you'll just basically compensate for the fact you ate a bit more on certain days. Are there any ways to treat MC4 mutations? Yes, there are now. So we've been working on this for many, many years. And one of the really exciting things now is some treatments are becoming available um, because you, know, you can't really treat something if you don't understand it. But now that we understand some of these things, we are now finding some treatments. Uh, all right, so someone said I was very fortunate to come to Cambridge to find out about the MC4 gene. Um, what's the evolutionary advantage of having skinny genes? So that's a good question. So of course you can think about the evolutionary advantage of having obesity genes, because those would be genes that tell you to go and look for food and also allow you to store extra energy as fat and therefore you would survive a bit more. Now you could say, why would you have skinny genes? Because obviously you probably wouldn't survive so much. So we think the skinny genes would probably be handy not to keep you really skin, but skinny and healthy is probably quite useful because you could like outrun a saber tooth tiger or something like that. So it's probably an effective way of avoiding predators. That's probably why we have the skinny genes. Right, so another question, have you explored a weight neutral approach to being curious about these genes? Do people in larger bodies really have false genes or just different genes? Uh, should we be using this stigmatizing language? Wow, okay. So, um, Interesting. So I often get asked questions a little bit like that, but um, I think they the genes. Mm, it, so stigmatizing language, I think, is a really important issue, and of course, we should avoid stigmatizing language. I guess I'm being quite specific and uh, scientific in my interpretation. There is a way of testing whether the genes are working, and if those genes are not working, then they are faulty. Now, actually, what I've shown you is genes can be faulty and cause obesity or increase your risk of obesity and they can be faulty and they can protect you from obesity. So faulty is purely a scientific or if you like a sort of functional way of commenting on the performance of the gene in the lab. Um, it's not really a faulty person. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's quite important to bring biology into this is that for a lot of the people I look after, most people, including many healthcare professionals, struggle to understand that there is biology underlying the weight problem. And they tend to therefore think that it's straightforward for people to take control and fix it themselves. So actually bringing science to the problem is important. Okay, so if we change our habits radically, so if we get stressed out, bad sleeping schedule, we move less, our bodies can change, but at molecular levels, and can we do something about it? So, you know, these are really important questions because these are real, this is the real world, right? So in the real world, absolutely, we all know this. If you get stressed, um, you're more likely to eat, most people. If you get stressed, you're more likely to want the high calorie foods. Uh, you're also less likely to sleep. Sleep also has an effect on your appetite and on your weight. Can you do anything about that? Well, of course, if you if, you, if those habits change, if the stress goes away, if it eases, if you're able to restore those things, you can restore that physiology. What we don't really understand, though, is how quickly does that happen? Can you restore someone to health if that happens quickly? or is there damage if you get stressed too frequently? Um, these are all really important questions that we don't yet understand. It's quite likely that if people are having repeated bouts of stress, that ultimately you get some damage from these things. Okay, I've asked answered that question. Is there common ground with MC4 and challenging behaviors? Uh, so yes, there is. So quite a few of these genes work in the brain, as I said, they work in the hypothalamus. And I mentioned that the hypothalamus controls um, things like sleep, temperature, uh, of course, appetite. The hypothalamus also controls other types of behavior. So things like aggression, mood, social interactions. These are all, again, things that are pretty fundamental for our survival. So animals do the same as well. So it's quite possible that certain genes 
when they're not working can have knock on effects on other behaviors. And we, I do see quite a lot of children actually who may have, for example, really struggle with their weight and also have autistic behavior or also have um, other behavioral problems. It's quite well known. We're beginning to find some of the genes that can explain that. Okay, so could epigenetic changes throughout the lifespan affect weight gain in later life? Uh, yes, so there is evidence in animals that depending on the diet of the mother, for example, there may be changes in the gene of the child or the offspring, which then affect the offspring's health later on. No evidence for that yet in people, um, but in theory, there is the chance that the diet, the lifestyle, the environment of the mother could affect the genes and therefore the health of the child. Uh, okay, I think that looks like most of my questions. Brilliant, so uh, I can see my cartoon up. This looks fantastic. Can we find better ways? My goodness, we've got graphs of data, we've got uh, cucumber slices and people <laughs> eating cucumber while on a seesaw. Um, and uh, yeah, stress and the broccoli and donut, which I really like. Um, I'm not sure what the lion is doing there, Josh. Oh, that's a pr the predator. Okay, fantastic. Oh, the lion and the zebra. Perfect. We've got a lion and a zebra and we've got DNA. My goodness, you've got like my entire research program uh, is on one cartoon. Fantastic. So I've really enjoyed seeing that. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, Jane, any final words? Only to say thanks to everyone for coming and please do fill in the feedback survey at the end when you log off. Thank you, Sadaf. Great. Okay. Thank you. I hope there's going to be a survey. Please do fill it in. Oh, yes, that's right. Okay. Goodbye. Great. Okay. Thanks, folks. Bye.